Well, welcome everybody to the Great Basin LCC webinar series. Uh, my name is Todd Hopkins. I'm the science coordinator for the Great Basin Landscape Conservation Cooperative. For those of you who might not know about the cooperatives, we're a partnership among public and private groups to meet large landscape conservation challenges and climate adaptation challenges across the five state Great Basin region. We've supported a variety of conservation projects, and we have today a webinar on one of those that we've supported. We hope these webinars can provide a platform for discussion about research and its application to the Great Basin. We, we will keep today's presentation relatively short, about 30 to 35 minutes, and reserve this entire second half of the hour for questions and discussions with Dr. Eric B., the principal investigator. Since there are a lot of folks on the webinar, we ask that you type your questions in as they arise, including during the webinar if you have a clarifying question. We will read out your questions for the speaker at the end of the presentation, and today's webinar will be recorded and available on the Great Basin LCC website. So on your screen, you'll notice a small collapsed control panel in the upper right corner. There's that red arrow. By clicking on that small arrow button, you can expand the control panel. Next slide. And in that expanded control panel, you can type in a question in the chat area, and then press send. Next slide. This question will be sent to us uh, as you do it, and like I said, we'll have clarifying questions during the webinar, but we'll save the majority of them for the end. So let me introduce today's speaker, Dr. Eric Beaver from the USGS Northern Rocky Mountain Science Center. Dr. Beaver received his BS uh, from University of California, Davis, go Aggies, his PhD in ecology and conservation from the University of Nata University of Nevada, Reno, go pack. Uh, he's got over 60 published articles in diverse scientific journals in numerous sub-disciplines sub of biology. His work has spanned salt scrub, sagebrush steppe, alpine, subalpine, subarctic, riparian, and you get the rest. Just about everything you can think of. He's a member of the IUCN Protected Area Specialist Group and the IUCN Lagomorph Specialist Group and membership in a number of national and international societies. Eric, take it away. Thanks a bunch, Todd. So to really um, <clears throat> illustrate some of the, the challenges and the implications for some of the work that we've been doing over the last over two decades, I'm just going to give you all a pop quiz. First, which is the most mountainous state in the USA? Yep, you guessed it, Nevada, which comprises the majority of most definitions of the Great Basin. Um, as defined by which has the most, the largest number of mountain ranges within an ecoregion, that would be the Great Basin. For example, how many mountain ranges are there in Nevada? It depends on who you ask. Um, uh, geology of the Great Basin said 186. McLean in his Silent Cordilleras book said 314. How many co-op weather stations out of 342 in Nevada that exist online how many of those exist at elevations above 7,500 feet, a commonly used uh, definition of defining alpine? Four of them. How many of those would you think are still in existence? Zero. Um, how many Great Basin mountain ranges have any kind of high elevation weather station? Out of those 314 in Nevada alone, um, I'm aware of about 13, including these many of which have been in existence for just a few years. And so in terms of our conservation future, what approximate percentage of the USA that is in the most strictly protected management status, what percentage of that occurs in mountains? Over 90%. So we've really put our eggs in the conservation future basket in mountains. And so collectively, I hope those, those pop quiz questions will really reinforce that we have a, a massive 100, over 100 million acre region here that we know relatively little about most of the area. And that is say, all these north-south trending ranges. And why is that challenging in the face of contemporary climate change? Because of the existence of rain shadows, varying lapse rates, meaning how fast does temperature uh, in, uh, decrease as one goes up in elevation. Also, um, cold air pooling and inversion layers really kind of uh, 
fill out the complexity and physiographic and therefore climatological complexity of this region. And that has great implications for the existence and locations of microrefugia, climate adaptation, restoration options, and the conservation portfolio. So these yellow squares across the region constitute archaeological or paleontological records of American pikas. The blue and the red areas are areas of historic presence of pikas. Red stars are the ones, um, sites at which pikas had been lost before 1999. Blue stars since 1999, uh, also extirpations. And the circles are places where they had remained. The green areas are the new locations of pikas that we've added to the study recently. So I, I said that I would um, give you an example here of the how the variable complexity of the Great Basin and its topography has effects on climate. From on high, textbooks on um, climatology have suggested that there's this uh, elapsed rate of 6.5 Celsius degrees as one changes a thousand meters of elevation. In a study in the Cascades on both the windward side and the lee side, Minder et al. found that here's that 6.5 Celsius degree um, lapse rate that's suggested. They found actually that it varies quite a bit across the year. And what I'd like you to see here in this red circle is that whether you're on the leeward side or the windward side, there's up to four or five Celsius degrees in what that lapse rate looks like. So it makes a lot of difference. And you can also see that there's a great difference in what that lapse rate looks like depending on the season, spring versus summer, and if we're talking about maximum temperature versus minimum temperature. So I'm going to argue one of my take-home messages for today is that mountain ecosystems really constitute cauldrons of dispersal, endemism, and climate adaptation. Because they contain sharp gradients in both biotic and abiotic conditions, they really constitute, um, have high areas of both alpha and beta diversity of species and represent very natural corridors for species redistributing themselves across the landscape in the midst of contemporary climate change. It's kind of taking the lens out wider, uh, mountains provide water, fresh water for two thirds of the world's people. Uh, provide a diversity of aesthetic and recreational values for a lot of different interest groups. We already talked about the conservation portfolio. So this slide is really an invitation to folks. These are the data that we have from across this region and would love to um, invite, um, we're providing these data to our collaborators uh, as, as they're available and um, <clears throat> invite collaborations on questions of all different scales. As you can see, there's 314 sensors, um, and I'll describe how those are distributed, in 21 different mountain ranges. Um, 30 of those sensors are at weather station heights, those two meters off the ground, uh, shaded from the sun direct sunlight. We also have data on GPS locations, um, WAS enabled, so three to seven meters accuracy of all animals, birds and mammals alike. Well, that's not all animals, sorry, Todd. <laughs> Um, that we that we encompass or that we encounter in our surveys as well as abundance. Um, I, I both identification and the local percent cover of the most dominant plant species, as well as temperature and relative humidity, six measures per day, um, going back to as far as 2005, and then in situ dates of snow cover and frequency of temperature exceedances. I'd like to, now that I've kind of introduced the, the, some of the issues with climate and the, what our um, sensor network can provide, I'd like to move now to species vulnerability to climate change. And it's really been cast as falling under three umbrellas, that of exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. Exposure being defined commonly as the magnitude of change in aspects of climate. And adaptive capacity being species inherent ability to accommodate and cope with climate change through behavioral plasticity, through evolution, and, and my, migratory ability. So here's what that sensor, look, sensor network looks like. 30 of them two meters off the ground, 14 of them above the talus but shaded, eight 
um, temperature models with copper around them to, to say what the heat balance would look like for an individual animal. 35 sensors down in those interstices where the animal mostly lives, collecting both temperature and relative humidity. And then 227 additional ones down in these interstices at places where they exist now or where they used to exist. And how do we tell these two things? Well, before I tell you that, I wanted to throw in for Todd, um, we're not studying ficus because they were voted North America's cutest mammal. They got second place in an online vote that would involved over tens of thousands of mammals, or votes, excuse me. <clears throat> Instead, there's a lot of reasons that they, that they serve as a great model for understanding aspects of climate species interactions. Um, in a pragmatic sense, um, there's a lot of reasons, in addition to the fact that they're diurnal, which um, investigators like to be diurnal as well, some of them, um, they're locally abundant, unlike, unlike mo many mammals, they can be locally abundant, so that gives us enough power to understand what's going on. They have relatively stable population sizes, so not this eruptive boom and bust cycle like some microteens. So that gives us a stronger signal-to-noise ratio and, and ability to tell more quickly what's happening. Um, again, unlike many mammals, they're very, very highly detectable, over 90% in a lot of studies, actually 95%-ish, um, both because of these, these calls from conspecific attraction, attracting mates, to defending their territories and their hay piles, to alarm calls. Um, and they're very nice in the, in, the, in the sense that they're obligately tied to this easily defined broken rock talus habitat, which is really not changing over time. Last time I checked, no one was really putting, um, had really keen ideas to have massive uh, subdivisions built on talus slides. So this is a, a difference from most mammals in that most losses are not con confused by habitat change over over the scale of decades, there's really no change whatsoever in the amount or the arrangement of that habitat. They're also a central place forager, um, which opens up questions of uh, forage. And in the same survey, we can both understand where they are and where they used to be. For example, the, the pieces of evidence that we use to tell us where they are currently, if we hear them, we know they're there. And unless you're Nietzsche, if you see them, you also know that they're there. And then they, they have these massive hay piles that they create that they use to be active during the winter to overwinter and that they defend. Uh, we also know that um, they, here's two types of evidences that tell us that pikas used to be in an area. These old um, fecal pellets, like all good lagomorphs, they re-ingest those to increase their um, both extraction of nutrients and water from the initial fecal pellet that looks more like this. And then we also can find old hay piles where they used to have be their centers of activity. So one of the um, first take-home messages that I wanted to share from this part of the talk is that results of climate change will often be more nuanced than species simply being climate change winners or losers. For example, we've seen very dramatically that extinct extirpation rates in this species have varied spatially. In these mainland regions of the Sierra Nevada and uh, Rocky Mountain massifs, for example, uh, Joseph Stewart, in a reanalysis, a revisit of uh, historic sites across California, in the Sierra Nevada massif, he found that only 5% of those sites had become extirpated. Similarly, Liesl Erb and her colleagues um, found in the Rockies, in a study <clears throat> um, of persistence there, that only three to six percent of those populations have been extirpated. I wanted to note that both of these are similar in latitude to the work in the Great Basin. This work here in the Rockies, on average, was over 300 meters higher than the work in the, in the Great Basin. Connie Millar and Bob Westfall, in their um, survey, which were not resurveyed, but just survey of easily accessible sites, they found only two percent of those sites had only old evidence in the Sierras. In contrast to those numbers, across 34 um, historic sites, we have uh, extirpation 
from all of the talus patches within three kilometers out of 44% of those sites. That is to say, each site um, is defined by not only the historic location, but all talus areas within about two miles of that area. For those of you who like uh, to watch NFL football, one site then constitutes 5,284 NFL football fields with end zones included. Thank you very much. So imagine putting that many football fields out on, out on the mountains, and that's what one of our sites looks like. So that 44 number, 44% uh, aligns pretty well with some other studies in the region. And neither of these are resurveys, but just seeing which percentage of the sites that they visit have only old evidence. And those were in more isolated areas like the Great Basin. <clears throat> what have we seen across the basin? So there are four periods of sampling now that we have put together. Um, the first was historically from 1898 to 1956. Between that and my, our first work in the 1990s, we saw six out of 25 populations be extirpated, about once every 11 years. The second period was once every 2.2 years, about five times faster, and four additional local extirpations. After 2008, no more additional extirpations among those original sites, but five out of new new sites have, have had pikas extirpated, and we're using radiocarbon dating to find when they were last there. In addition to those site-wide losses, we're seeing um, retraction of the minimum elevation of detections within sites from the bottom moving up. Um, between that first period, that averaged about 13 meters per decade region-wide. After 1999 through 2008, that averaged basin-wide 145 meters per decade. That's a region-wide um, estimate of about 50 feet like, every single year. Um, that has become more pedestrian after 2008, going down to 54 meters per decade. I'd like to just contrast these rates with rates in the two meta-analyses that were done in 2003 and 2011, 6.1 and 11 meters per decade for species around the world that were exhibiting range shifts. In contrast to this minimum elevation, however, there's really been not much change in the maximum, the mean, or the median elevation of detections of pikas within sites. So just really a concatenation from the bottom up. So I kind of a little bit of a philosophical question. What is exposure? Um, most folks have defined that as amount of change in those climate parameters. Um, and trying to understand that pattern of losses across the basin, we found that amount of climate change in biologically relevant aspects of, of climate. So for example, what is that average summer temperature? How frequently is it very, very, very hot? How frequently is it very cold? Amount of change in those parameters between two 31-year uh, time periods didn't predict well at all where pikas were lost from. Instead, it was the sites that were kind of already warmer and drier to begin with. So I think that kind of proximity to the edge of a species range may be a better proxy for exposure than how much climate is changing. Um, and I just, this is a slide to say that um, understanding these how, how and why species are responding to climate change I think is the key piece, not just, we can't simply stop at saying what's happening, but how and why those things are happening. I think it's really important because that is the grist that we need for the mills of understanding climate adaptation, mitigation, management, and conservation strategies. Otherwise, we're resorting to a much stronger um, trial and error kind of situation. Um, and so just to, to quickly rehash for you what some of those uh, trends were across the basin, places where they were lost from originally were much more frequently very hot down in those talus interstices, the places where they were living. Um, uh, on average, across the entire summer, and actually including September as well, average about five Celsius degrees warmer. 
more uh, less frequently snow covered and thus more frequently very cold. So ironically, both warmer in the, win in the summer and colder in the winter. And uh, analyses trying to suss out which thing was most strongly driving that pattern of loss suggested that this average summer temperature was the strongest driver. So I'm going to ask you all to put yourselves in my shoes and you try to figure out from some of these pictures what you think or what your hypotheses would be about why they've been lost from some parts of the basin and not others. I'm going to show you first four pictures of where they remain and then four pictures of where they've been lost. And I want to see if you can think of some hypotheses about what you think is going on. First four are where they remain. Different parts of the basin, all of them, and now places where they've been lost from. In this picture, you can see kind of the multi-scale nature of this patchy habitat. And here's one canyon here. This site has about six canyons that we survey across. This is in the White Mountains. And here's in the central Nevada monitor range. So one of the things that you may have surmised is that the, the earlier four pictures may have seemed greener. And so we tested whether the greenness of the vegetation, as um, quantified by NDVI, across our sampling period in the 2000s, did that strongly predict density of pikas. And in fact, it quite strongly did. You may also have noticed that maybe the, the latter four sites look like drier adapted tree species, more PJ kinds of stuff. And so it turns out that although we initially were looking at things related to temperature, we found that these water balance metrics like maximum snowpack, precipitation during the growing season, those predicted pica density in 2000 surveys better than that even temperature. And these are just the, the, the ranking of variables and their ability to predict density. So this being the best predictor and this being the worst predictor. So in terms of understanding where picus have been lost from, one other thing that I think really resonates with a lot of wildlife species is that the rules are changing. This is again a list of the importance of the variable using the same sites across the basin for the same species and the same model set, the amount of habitat of talus was the best predictor of where pikas were lost from during the 20th century. That became the third best predictor after 1999. And in fact, these two climatic predictors, uh, uh, circled in blue, both became the best predictors of extirpations after 1999. And this is in this, uh, this kind of multiple working hypotheses that we're comparing evidence for across both periods. Similarly with abundance, even um, in terms of the number, the, the numbers of animals we found in the different periods of survey, we found even though the surveys were only eight years apart and used the same models in both periods, we had about as much difference in the relative importance in the top being the most predictive and the, the bottom being the least predictive between these two periods as was possible going from the first over here to the last and the next one and great changes in really all of these measures. I wanted to highlight for you a, um, the fact that amount of habitat that we surveyed in the field was a very low um, ability to predict where pikas were lost from. And that's really a game changer. If we can't use these habitat wildlife relationships to tell us where species are going to be lost from, we have now another filter. So not all island area can be habitat due to strong effects of climate then, as you can see here by these two pictures, very different. So just some research in progress. Um, given that Nevada is the driest state and the Great Basin is a very strongly water limited eco region, we put out some sensors and just I will be summarizing these data for the entire four years in the next two weeks. We're asking does relative humidity or derivatives thereof, vapor pressure deficit or dew point, better predict pica persistence than do temperature measures to see if some aspect of water stress is, is going to be telling us what's going on better than temperature. 
just for example, in some early work in our first year of data we collected, we saw that the, the places where pikas remained were about 23% absolute difference higher relative humidity than were the extirpated sites. So we're looking at several response variables here because this hasn't been ever done before, um, hasn't been done before. So we're looking at things that relate to various mechanisms of stress, average year-round chronic relative humidity, winter relative humidity, average in the summer, average daily low RH, and the average daily high and that daily spread in the summer, and then using some um, thresholds um, relating to likely very, very dry, probably snow covered, and then 70 when it's either snow or rain is around. And then understanding that variability is, is part of the game as well. Another cool thing that I'm excited to, sh excited to share with you is some work with Thomas Millette and Aaron Johnston. Um, looking at, he, we, we flew over 10 of these sites uh, <clears throat> and uh, put several cameras on the belly of the plane. And we have imagery at 2 to 4 centimeters resolution. And yes, you heard that right. If you go down, you can see very, very fine scale information here um, that both in true color, color infrared and thermal infrared, and this is absolute temperature, not relative temperature. And so our goal here is we've, we're trying to calibrate those temperatures sensed from the plane with the, the temperatures down in the talus where this is an, a location of one of our sensors down there that was recording temperature every 30 seconds when the plane was flying over to create a very fine resolution model of where we would think the pikas would be found in new areas that have never been surveyed. So essentially to give us a predictive tool. Another cool thing is that we're trying to understand a possible mechanism here, working with some folks from the University of Utah is to assess whether plant chemistry is mediating distributional changes. At two levels of comparison, both comparing chemistry of the plants in the extant sites versus the pica extirpated sites, as well as between the, the species preferred by pikas given their distributions and non-preferred plant species in terms of percent water, percent nitrogen, percent fiber, and these phenolics. Another cool and fun thing that we're looking at is assessing whether limitation of surface activity, in other words, it's too hot for them to be outside so they can't be surface active, therefore constraining ability to get forage, ability to find mates, ability to defend your territory, to see whether that limitation more strongly constrains pica distribution than temperature. And this is kind of like the work by Barry Sinervo et al. for uh, lizards of North America, but this is for an endothermic mammal. And this is a very strongly uh, mechanistic model, really understanding the physiology of what's going on here and a strong parameterization of these models. So um, this is then a graph or a map of the predicted number of hours across summer that pikas are expected to be active across the west. You can see great variability within the Great Basin and then across the entire west. And kind of broadening the lens out, um, we've used a lot of our work to think about how uh, land managers and other conservation practitioners can um, think about how, how to <clears throat> uh, manage for adaptive capacity in species. What can we do in the face of contemporary climate change? Um, so we borrowed from Hutchinson's concepts of the fundamental and realized niches to propose this framework for thinking about management actions in the face of that climate change. Some management actions, like managed relocation and genetic engineering, actually can change the fundamental or intrinsic uh, adaptive capacity of species to accommodate climate change, for example, by um, changing their dispersal ability or by changing their genetic uh, diversity and ability to uh, create mutations. But more commonly, that's going to be on management's effects on extrinsic factors that really funnel down and filter the fundamental capacity down to a species realized or exhibited adaptive capacity. 
So I'm happy to share this with you. Um, if you're interested, let me know. And we've been asking questions, for example, well, is that, is this, um, the existence of behavioral plasticity, does that reflect what species trends are exhibited across their range? So whereas in the Great Basin over the last 21 years, I've never seen pikas put a hay pile anywhere but on top of the talus, as you can see here. In contrast, in the greater Yellowstone ecoregion, in the center of their range, they're putting hay piles in crazy places, under the tree bases, in a standing dead tree, um, in a um, slash pile that's 100 meters from the edge of the talus, and even in down, down wood. And um, this really highlights these places are actually serving as great micro refugia, um, buffering temperatures even more so than the talus. And I just like to kind of complex lava flow labyrinths that exist there, very, very complex, or in the Columbia River Gorge, due to the fact that it's a deep gorge, has a very strong forest cover, and a lot of moss insulation. In the basin, we've really yet to identify a lot of refugial dynamics in those Great Basin Montana, Montana areas. Um, Connie Millar has suggested that most of her sites were associated, where she did find pikas, those were associated with rock ice features. And I have not yet seen many of those across the basin. Higher adaptive capacity. In this article, um, we've suggested two different approaches, either a, um, a trait-based approach or a triage-based approach for thinking about which species might receive better attention depending on the, the spatial extent of the, the area. Species that have maybe shorter generation time or higher mutation rates, greater dispersal capacity, or greater ability to learn behavior, like this picture of me when I was a young'un. And then if you're interested, we can talk later about where might species have higher adaptive capacity in their range. And this is a cool thing, working with a, uh, a savant of a species distribution modeler Adam Smith of the Missouri Botanical Garden. Um, we see very different, using the same predictive uh, predictors, excuse me, same climatic predictors for both the Great Basin here in orange and the entire western U.S. in blue, we see very different factors identified as important between the two regions, whereas elevations uh, knocks everything else out of the water across the, the entire west. It's average at best in the basin. Instead, this precipitation of the driest quarter is a real strong driver in the basin. And again, you see the, the ones that are the factors that are identified as highest are very different between the two. So the basin is very different from many other parts in that regard. Even in a, in a graphical perspective, this is also something we're excited about. Uh, <clears throat> allowing the factors that constrain distribution to vary spatially we see that the factors that are most strongly constraining distribution vary both not only within the Great Basin, but across the West. And this, these mechanisms here really reflect the mechanisms that we've hypothesized that are driving the dynamics, really reflect the species life history and kind of, and we've really been encouraging ourselves to think like a pika. And kind of what are some of the, another implication for some of this work? Um, if we look at this regression here, where these, these sites have all lost their pikas and these sites at the top retain their pikas, we see this purple dashed line that really discriminates between those two groups. Um, and so, um, and this is then just a, a reflection of pika persistence against these average summer temperatures and how frequently it was very cold. So I guess the point here, here is that if you're going to be putting pikas back into sites, it seems to me there's very little utility or hope in putting them back in here. But if you were to put them in here, in sites that are right in the midst of all these extant sites, I think that's a lot wiser chance if 
we get to a place where we're using assisted relocations into the future. Um, and then just looking at drought really quickly, um, we had this in 2011 was a strong precipitation year. So the following year, we saw a one year lag in that low elevation boundary. Four, at four sites, they expanded downslope and upslope at only one site. After the strong drought year of 2012, um, there was, um, they retracted upslope at five sites and a downslope at none of those sites. Uh, abundance did not delay one year. In 2012, that strong drought year, abundances were about half of what they were in the 2000s compared uh, within sites. At many of our sites, we had a relatively good year precip wise in 2013. Um, these were a different set of sites. That was about 1.4 times what they were in the 2000s. So um, just to again to sum up some of the strengths of our research program, largely um, an unsampled part of the basin for most of the studies going on there. We're looking at all kinds of questions about climate and wildlife responses to it. We have 21 years of data collection plus this historical data set going back to 1898. And here is then um, an example of, of data at a site with each color representing a different sensor. And the sensors are placed down in the talus or above the talus um, at different aspects and elevations across those 5,300 football fields in a site. Then we have fine scale resolution both spatially and temporally, for example, six times a day year round. So what are the things I'm hoping you take home from this? I hope that this, this, this sequence of slides has illustrated both the heterogeneity and the nuance of how climate is acting on wildlife across the basin. We're continuing to iteratively refine our understanding of the mechanisms by which climate is uh, changing species distributions. Often, but not always, reintroduction, reintroduction would be in vain and not helpful for the conservation picture. Uh, really screams out for the importance and the need of manipulative climate adaptation experiments uh, for ex and things that would um, be okay with IACUC committees. For example, the uh, <clears throat> manipulation of forage resources in some places by additions um, and some other ideas as well. And uh, we have much more coming on the microclimate data side. For example, comparing the climatology of the talus areas to the, to the ambient temperatures. And then, then finally, the need to complement these data with similar data basin-wide on non-talus species to get a fuller understanding of how wildlife are um, responding. With that, I'd like to thank a bunch of co-authors, funders, and folks for field assistance, as well as colleagues and collaborators on our most recent work, as well as folks whose laurels this work rests upon. E. Raymond Hall, Joseph Grinnell, and Hart Merriam, and my a more favorite picture of E. Raymond Hall. With that, I will stop and take questions. Thanks. Thanks very much, Eric. So if folks will go to that little tab on the right-hand side and type in their questions, we'll read them out for Eric. We don't have any questions yet, but uh, I'm on standby. All right. Thanks, Sarah. So, Eric, I have one question for you. Um, the yes. upward trend in pica, is there any relationship there, and this is my naivete showing, any relationship with invasive species, either plant or animal, from the bottom coming up? Uh, I hadn't thought of that. Um, <clears throat> Upward, oh, upward trend. Um, um, yeah, actually, so most most of our sites, we have very little um, invasive plant cover at the elevations that they're at. There, there is one exception to that um, in the Hayes Canyon range, and that's a place where um, we wrote a paper about that. Given how it just seems very, very low, and um, the land uses around there seem to be not 
um, such that it's going to be promoting pica persistence, but they're there regardless. Um, and they actually hay that cheatgrass, which is striking because there's a period that, that that's uh, palatable, but pretty quickly it senesces and becomes mechanically difficult for mammals to, to consume it. So I hadn't considered that. Great idea. But in most of the sites, however, it's a pretty, the invasive species are a very minor component. Is now an appropriate time, Todd and Sarah, to share this CalTOPO brief, Lee? Sure, sure, unless we have some questions waiting, Sarah? We don't have any questions waiting. So go ahead, Eric. So I just thought I would share with you all um, this cool tool that I found. Um, and this is um, one of the sites um, in the Great Basin. This one's in northeastern California. And we've created, um, here's the historic location here, and this is the green dot, and then uh, a radius of a, uh, one kilometer and three kilometers. And then we've identified online this Caltopo site where the talus areas are. And I just thought I would show you all the um, resolution of these data. As I was telling Todd before the call, these data are 31 centimeters in resolution. So this is now the first time in my life that I can actually tell whether a talus patch is going to be uh, suitable for pikas or not, um, just from the, just from my computer chair. I actually think that the second one is a little bit better, but you can see here, you can actually see individual branches on these trees. This really is a game changer for understanding uh, so this then we can take the GPS points and understand the areas of these talus patches to know where to look uh, for talus without having to go through every single football field. <laughs> this is a really neat tool. You can do a lot of things you can do with this. So Eric, uh, we have a question from the room. Is this uh, is this only for California, or is this? I mean, you said Great Basin. How wide ranging is this? Layers. Um, let's see if I can find it. I have another one open. Yeah, and I'll bring it. Up. Wait, whoops. Here we are. And then I heard Sarah chime in, so we'll go to her question after that. So here's here's a similar one from Glacier. So it's as far as I know, it's at least nationwide, um, and it probably uh, I don't know how far beyond that. This is for Glacier National Park. Same kind of situation. We have uh, two questions that have come in. The first question is, have you looked at pica population differences between substrates such as karst versus metamorphic rocks? That is an outstanding question. Um, we have struggled to figure out um, what those covariates would look like. Um, um, various folks have looked at rock color um, just as a um, metric for, under, for as a proxy for understanding what that absorption of sunlight would look like and trying to understand porosity and for how quickly the temperature might be dissipated from those rocks. Um, I'd be keen to talk to that person more afterwards um, because this, this 100 million acre region spans so many diversity, uh, such a diversity of rock types that um, we're finding we're struggling to to figure out what does that kind of boil down to as as the most important aspect of those rocks. I'd love to talk more about that though. Great great question. Thanks, Eric. Why don't you go back to the last slide so whoever it is great. can get your email address. Go ahead, Excellent. Sarah. Our second question is. Is there a correlation between groundwater use across the basin and water balance metrics? And if so, is this correlated to subsurface soil temperatures and moisture content that would impact pikas? Well, that's a great question. Um, I, we don't have data on all of those things. Um, let's see. Um, so we don't, we haven't looked at um, groundwater use um, 
Although there is that, and I don't know the the, the latest status of that uh, transfer down to the Las Vegas uh, water district. Many of these places are remote enough that there isn't, as far as we're I'm aware of, um, capturing of water. So I don't I don't think that's the case in many of these sites since they're towards the tops of the mountains. Um, but yeah, soil moisture I think would be a great a great thing to add to this, um, and if if that person can contact me to to let me know about um, what what would be what would make the most sense in terms of um, cost effectiveness, given that each site is 5,300 football fields, um, be great to know. Um, uh, I think yeah, a lot of the vegetation would obviously correlate to the soil moisture and probably fire, of course, fire risk would as well. Um, so great, great question. But not yet, not yet um, breached or broached yet. We had a third question come in. Is there a study or publication using the non-stationary distribution modeling approach? I'm curious about the ability of that modeling approach for looking at the drivers of spatial variation of species distribution. Uh, as far as I'm aware, um, there is not. Um, I have a couple of uh, references of, uh, there's one study looked at a tree species, the subspecies of the tree, where the species um, niche um, did not overlap in those different portions of its range, but uh, according to Adam Smith, this is really a new technique and um, something to me that I think has a lot of promise because um, at least from my perspective, I'm not, I'm not willing to buy into the fact that the same factors working in the same way are going to affect a species that doesn't move, typically doesn't even move one kilometer within a season across from British Columbia and Alberta down to the Great Basin and Wyoming and, and New Mexico, that just does not seem like the, a, a good assumption. So this is this is a, a really a, a new approach, uh, according to Adam, and I think it's it's, it's not only from a from, a, from an academic perspective, but really for someone who's like, well, what's what's happening here? We're going to be able to tell folks at a land management unit, here's here's what's happening and what's constraining the species in your neck of the woods, which I think has a ton of value in terms of what what kinds of climate adaptations make the most sense within an area. Hey, uh, Eric, um, this is from, I have a related question piggybacking off that idea of better data. Um, you did a lot of work on that pika habitat looking at the um, best um, correlated factor, what I'd call like ecologically relevant data layers. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you had a sense in your studies of how much better the performance is compared to your data classics like mean annual precipitation or mean annual temperature, that stuff that you can get anywhere nationally and easily versus your more highly specialized and awesome data. Great question, yeah, and actually I have to um, sheepishly admit that I had initially used mean mean annual precipitation as a predictor and, and never found it to be important in any of my analyses. And I, I was like trumpeting the importance of understanding mechanisms. And someone finally someone finally asked the emperor about having no clothes and said, "Well, what are you doing when you're you're throwing snow and rain in the same bucket?" And so that that really has got got um, propelled us to thinking really strongly in that regard. And so um, in that one paper in 2010 where I showed that um, climate change wasn't any good, um, I think as I recall in that paper we also compared the ability of data from down in in those interstices performed a lot better than the gridded data products. So um, <clears throat> that's, that's kind of a um, a frontier where we're trying to, to see how we can make some strides there with that those aerial overflights and see what that looks like. Um, so it, I guess the, the, the more general answer is though, um, they are better 
at telling us what's going on. How much better depends kind of on the species and on the context um, that, that we're talking about. We had one commenter interested in what you're working on for your dissertation. Uh, thanks for asking. The um, my dissertation was the work in the 1990s, and that was um, <clears throat> these patterns of persistence of pikas across the Great Basin, um, uh, as well as um, the effects of free roaming horses on a lot of different components of mountain ecosystems across the Great Basin in nine different mountain ranges, from uh, soils to plants to ant mound ant mounds to reptiles and small mammals. So many moons ago, late 90s. Uh, more clarification to that last comment. They are interested in Adam Smith's non-stationary modeling work. OK. And if that's something um, he's working on for his dissertation. No, yeah, Adam is done as well. Um, um, and he, uh, we've got uh, a couple of postdocs, um, Aaron Johnston and Mimi Kessler, who are really digging into that. And we, what's really fun about this project, is we have um, uh, probably 65 or more folks who've contributed data to this. And it's just been really a neat, neat opportunity because it's really all of us coming together to try to, to work at these applied questions. And, um, asking a lot of different questions. Does scale matter? Does Are things different in the Great Basin than elsewhere? Um, does it matter if we use just presences versus presences? And in, 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 my, in my case, I actually have confirmed non-detections. A lot of folks just have presences. So do we get different results if we use absences as well as presences? Um, so these are things that are, um, were, in fact, Tomorrow, I'm going to be emailing all of those folks, and here are our choices for analysis strategies. So those are going to be coming; those papers are going to be coming out in uh, a couple of months from now. I'm really excited about those. I'd love to have feedback on perspectives on those. We don't have any um, questions through the webinar at this time. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Eric. Uh, very nice webinar. Uh, I'll give folks one last chance to type in a question while I remind you that after the webinar, you have you've registered, you will receive an email. In that email is a very, very short two-minute long survey. Um, we didn't mention it at the outset, but all of our surveys, all of our webinars are actually Yelp ranked or something like that, one to five stars. So it's very important that you fill out those couple of questions, the first one being on a scale of one to five, what did you think of the overall content quality and presentation? Eric is striving for the first fifth star, five star webinar for the Great Basin LCC, so please help him along if you feel he deserves it. Are there any additional questions, Sarah? There are no additional questions at this time. All right, well thank you everyone. Have a good afternoon. Please do remember to fill out our survey. Uh, Help Eric get to that five-star rating. Bye-bye. Thanks.